This is News 8 at 10 on My TV 9. We could be in for some wild weather overnight. This is a live look outside. You can hear the wind. All right, first though, we got some breaking news out of Hartford tonight. A house fire on Blue Hills Avenue has sent four firefighters to the hospital. One of them in critical condition at St. Francis, another in the burn unit at Bridgeport Hospital in serious condition. The other two firefighters are expected to have minor injuries. Bob Wilson is on the phone. Bob, what do you have on this firefighter that we understand is very critically injured? It is very grave at this hour, and it's pretty sad. We've been trying to follow the firefighters as we've been out at Blue Hills Avenue, and we've been driving over to the hospital at St. Francis Hospital, and we're now here at the police department, and we may go back over to the hospital before 11 o'clock. They expect a major announcement, and uh, it just looks very, very grim at this point. And you can just tell by the mood of firefighters, by the sense of urgency and the sadness in the air. Uh, there's not been an official announcement, but it does not look good. And I can just tell you, we talked to a witness who said her daughter was in the fire, and she was on the first floor, and there was smoke heavy coming out of the second floor. The firehouse is literally right next door to the fire. It's right, you, you, you can see it. They're, they're right next to each other. And the firehouse, the firefighters came out of there, and we don't know what happened from there, but she said one of the firefighters was up on the top floor where this heavy, heavy, thick smoke. She said he became disoriented, and he did fall out of a window. And they, they don't know if that's the firefighter. We do have... Pictures you'll see at 11 o'clock of fire gear being picked up and put in the back of a police cruiser. All that the helmet and the air pack and the bunker gear of a firefighter. And it's just, it is a very somber, sad mood out here. And we've just kind of been trying to follow it as best we can without getting in their way because there's a lot of emotion here as, as they we wait for the 11 o'clock announcement. Okay, we can only imagine, and our best to the firefighters' family. Go ahead, Darren. We're expecting to hear more about that. Bob will be back at 11. When they have that briefing at 11 o'clock, we'll bring that to you over on News 8 on WTNH. All right, now the weather. We will be watching that very closely as the fronts come in. Yeah, wind expected to kick up overnight, getting maybe into the 40 or 50 mile an hour range with some wind as well. Meteorologist Justin Goldstein here now with the first check on your forecast. Justin? Darren and Ann, when you get to the 40 to 50 mile per hour range of wind, and there'll be brief instances where that happens, that's where we can get some sporadic power outages, some branches and limbs to come down. But it will be a loud night tonight with rain, thunder, the windows will rattle a little bit and so will those screens and you'll hear the leaves rustling as well. And we mentioned under the impacts here, notice the last icon here, a tornado, a low risk, but a risk nonetheless. And we have to pass that along to you and mention that because the winds aloft are so changeable and very fast that any thunderstorm that gets caught up in a wind starts spinning and you get a brief touchdown. May only be on the ground for 20 or 30 seconds, but that's enough to do damage. If we recall back to July, the Wolkett tornado only on the ground for less than uh, 30 seconds. And remember the damage it did. Nearest rain now coming out of Philadelphia, crossing the Delaware River. This should get here oh, around midnight or so and some more storms back towards Pennsylvania and towards Virginia. Look what's going on in Kentucky and West Virginia. A lot of tornado warnings there. A couple have been confirmed on the ground. I don't think it's that violent here, but we'll watch this swing in overnight. By first thing tomorrow morning, rain is gone. Temperatures now 61 Oxford, 62 Durham at 62 in Granby. It's mild. It's still breezy. Here's tomorrow's planner once the storms are done. We'll see sunshine and wind 74 on the shoreline. We'll go 78 inland tomorrow. Some big changes ahead in the eight day forecast. We'll check the radar again. We'll see you in about 15 minutes. Thanks so much. State and local branches of the NAACP held a news conference today where a mother of a victim who was tasered and died spoke. Yeah, 31 year old Lashano Gilbert died over the weekend after New London police officers tasered him twice in eight hours. The NAACP says it is launching an investigation into what they're calling police misconduct and excessive force. They claim Gilbert may have been tasered three times. His mother flew in from Bermuda this morning to mourn her son's death. He's come home and go, and then he's supposed to come again. And that's it. That's it. They'll come home, they'll make it home, just as home right here, because he, he died here, they take his life right here. New London police say they tasered Gilbert because he was acting bizarrely and violently. Now to a video shocking people across the state this evening. A police officer shoots a dog that attacked him, and the whole thing was caught on camera. Yeah, the officer is okay. The dog quarantined. News 8's Tina Detell has that story. 
It was right on this sidewalk that the dog was standing when the officer spotted him in the middle of the night. Now, the owner tells us that she had just let another dog out of the back door of the house to go to the bathroom when this dog here, Tucker, ran out as well. Moments later, she says, she heard the shots fired. Ten seconds later, pop, pop. I was just amazed how, how quick. The dog's owner did not want to be identified, but talked to News 8 outside the East Haven Police Department. Here's a look at the video, all caught on the officer's from? body armor camera at 2.45 hmm? Tuesday morning. You can see him approach the dog, asking him where he comes from. The dog turns away and then lunges at the officer, who fires. He didn't do anything to provoke the dog whatsoever. He just walked up to it, and he kept the distance from himself and the dog, but unfortunately the dog you know, still attacked him. Why didn't he tase him instead of shooting him? We showed the owner the video of the attack involving her dog, Tucker. She says is a Rhodesian Ridgeback Labrador Retriever mix, not a pit bull mix. It's <laughs> not typical that. behavior of, of Tucker. He, he's never, never seen anything like that before. Fortunately, the officer was not injured, and Tucker appears to be recovering from the single gunshot wound. Um, doctor tells me came within about a quarter of an inch of his heart. It didn't hit his lungs either, but came close enough to cause them trauma. He's got bruising in his lungs. He's got, excuse me, inappropriate air trapped around his lungs. But he's very stable. He's doing very fine. Despite the alleged attack, there is no word East Haven police plan to quarantine the dog. In fact, the town is footing the bill. He's a very lucky dog. Folks at the animal hospital tell us that the town has authorized $800 for this dog's care. And right now, there's still money left if he needs further treatment. In East Haven, Tina Detell, News 8. Friends and family held a vigil for 18-year-old Eric Delage today. He was hit by two cars in Waterbury last night and died. One driver is in custody. The search is on for the other driver in the hit-and-run case. It happened about 8 last evening. Police say Israel Diaz hit Delage while he was riding his bike on Baldwin Street. He fell to the ground, and that's when he was hit by a second driver who took off. The victim's family is pleading for that driver to come forward. He didn't deserve to die the way he did. All I got to say is, if you see this, and it was you, you know who you are, turn yourself in. Be a man about choice. Diaz is under arrest facing several charges, including evading responsibility. Former Connecticut and New York News anchor Rob Morrison cut a plea deal today to stay out of prison for harassing his estranged wife. Morrison pled guilty today to breach of peace. He bombarded his wife with more than 120 phone calls over a single weekend. Morrison got a six-month suspended sentence and two years probation. This is not his first brush with the law. In 2013, he was arrested for choking his wife and threatening to kill her. Those charges were later dropped. The former deputy commissioner of the DMV has pleaded not guilty in the case of sexual assault on a minor. Victor Diaz appeared in Waterbury District Court today. He resigned last month as he was under investigation. Police had received a complaint from a 15-year-old girl saying he had been assaulting her from the time she was in the sixth grade and that it allegedly continued right into her high school years. I've been concerned with his mental health, visiting him in Garner on three occasions. Uh, we hope to get all the information again today and we're going to ferret out what's true and what's not true from the allegations. And hopefully when all is said and done, he'll get his day in court. His attorney also mentioned Diaz has been treated for post-traumatic stress disorder following eight years in the military. And just ahead here tonight on News 8 at 10, a Delaware mother facing charges tonight over what her little girl brought to daycare that sent some kids to the hospital. We're finding out more about the teenager arrested in Chicago who was on his way to join the terrorist group ISIS. Also, the former defense secretary taking some shots at President Obama tonight over his handling of the ISIS standoff. That's coming up here in a moment. But first, here's meteorologist Justin Goldstein. Darren, here's a live look from Stratford. This is the banks of the Housatonic River at the Bird's Eye Marina. High tide about an hour away. And notice how high the water is. This will keep going. Expecting tides around one foot higher than normal tonight. What you can expect overnight and the next eight days ahead. And, and coming up tonight on News 8 at 11.
-hmm. We see you. We want to take you back to Hartford now. A house fire on Blue Hills Avenue has injured four firefighters. One of those firefighters was said to be very critically injured. Yeah, let's get a live update now. News ace Bob Wilson is out there. Bob, we're recapping this. We, we have uh, know that one of these firefighters was very badly hurt in this, right? Very, very, very grave, and the news does not look good. We were supposed to get an announcement at 10 o'clock, but they were, we were told the chief was just in no condition to talk the fire chief so at 11 o'clock we're expecting a briefing but just this video just shows it all this is a shot of firefighter gear bunker gear being put into the back of a police car and the police officer the way he's carrying it the way he's handling it is very gently it's with respect and you just look at that and it's a very sad scene out here I mean a lot of people know these firefighters the, the firefighters go into those burning buildings and we did talk with a witness who said the fire was, there's a lot of smoke on the second floor. The firehouse is right next door to this house. And the firefighters went in. They went in and did their job. And she said minutes later, the smoke was so thick, she didn't know how anybody could be up there. And then they, she said they saw him come out the window of the second story. And it's just a very, very sad scene here. There's been no official announcement, no word. We've been over to St. Francis Hospital where the fire trucks and the uh, police cars are lined up with their lights out in the emergency in front of the emergency room there and we're here waiting word we're told that there will be an announcement at 11 o'clock we know another firefighter was sent down to the burn unit in Bridgeport in uh, some pretty serious condition with uh, burns as well as cuts and and injuries from fighting the fire and there were two other firefighters who sustained other injuries not as serious as those tonight everybody's heart goes out to the firefighter and the family as we wait word on, on an official word on what happened with the firefighter Bob, it's so early in all of this, but we're trying to understand this here. So witnesses are telling us that one of these firefighters, and we don't even know if the, the one hurt the worst, did, did he fall out a window? What, what happened? Do we have any clarity about what happened up there, Bob? Well, according to the witness, he, he came out of the window. It was so thick of smoke, he was disoriented, couldn't find his way out. It was just pitch black up there, and he went out the window is how it was described. And we don't know if that's the firefighter that's in the critical condition right now or if that's the one that went to the burn unit. Uh, there's still a lot of clarification here. And to be honest, we have been really keeping our distance. You know, you see the guys coming out. They've got tears in their eyes. It's pretty emotional. You don't want to go up to them and say, hey, what happened? You know, they're, they're pretty sad. So that's, it's, it's a pretty... Pretty tough scene here in Hartford. Bob Wilson, thanks. Uh, we are expecting that briefing, as we said, 11 o'clock tonight. We will bring that to you on News 8 over on WTNH. Bob, we'll check back with you in just a little bit.
Other news of the evening now. A former member of President Obama's national security team is taking some shots at the president's handling of the war with ISIS. Former Defense Secretary Leon Panetta says it was a mistake for the president to rule out the use of ground troops against ISIS. Don't get me wrong, I think he was very strong in terms of the war on terrorism, and he made some tough decisions. But there were these decisions that basically never were confronted that I think uh, in many ways uh, contributed to the problems we're facing today. Panetta says to make airstrikes work, you have to identify targets, and to do that, he says you have to have boots on the ground. A 19-year-old American man from a Chicago suburb was stopped trying to board a flight to Turkey. Allegedly, this was the first step in his plan to sneak into Syria to join the Islamic State group ISIS. Mohammed Hazmakan, who lived with his parents, was arrested at O'Hare over the weekend. He is charged with attempting to provide material support to a foreign terrorist group which carries a maximum 15-year prison sentence. Investigators said Khan left a three-page handwritten letter in his bedroom for his parents that expressed anger over his U.S. taxes being used to kill his Muslim brothers and sisters. Khan was ordered to remain jailed until at least a detention hearing on Thursday. Meantime, the FBI is trying to find out who is the English-speaking person seen in a propaganda video put out in September. In that video, the man whose face is obscured by a mask alternate seamlessly between English and Arabic. He can be seen standing in front of prisoners as they dig their own graves. He has what is believed to be a North American accent. And we're here with the soldiers of Bashar. You can see them now digging their own graves in the very place where they were stationed. Security analysts say ISIS put the man on camera because he seems American in order to protect, project fear to the U.S. and project power. A Delaware mother facing charges tonight after her four-year-old daughter brought 250 packets of heroin to her daycare. Police say the little girl passed out these packets of drugs to her friends thinking it was candy. Several of the kids who got those packets were taken to the hospital just to be checked out. They are all fine. They found it right when she passed it out. So we do thank God that they had a watchful eye. Um, and most of all, we thank God that none of the children were injured. The mother is charged with drug possession and endangering the welfare of a child. Her daughter is in the custody of the state tonight. Can't even imagine. Mm. All right, this is a setup to a lot of wind, rain, stormy night. And by the time you wake up tomorrow morning, it's all gone. Mm. So it's going to be a loud night tonight, and uh, the power might flicker on a little bit. It might be a good idea to have a uh, cell phone charged right next to the bed, set the alarm on it in case the power goes out. You need to be up at 5.30. If your clock is flashing 12, not get them for 5 30. Phone will do it, yeah. But you get the idea. All right, here's a look at the storm setup and some of the impacts. Wind will be the primary threat from any downpours and uh, thunderstorms that pop up overnight. Yes, there can be some localized street flooding. There will be some lightning and some thunder as well. Have to mention tornado. It's on the low end of the impact scale, but it's present nonetheless. And because it's so windy, any storm can get caught in a gust of wind and start spiraling. Overnight, inside the thunderstorms, it's gustiest. It's still a breezy day tomorrow and Thursday. The wind backs off for Friday. Some of the threats that happen during 30 to 35 mile per hour winds, it's mainly confined to just leaves and not so much the power outages. When you get to 50 to 55, like inside of a thunderstorm, brief instances, and then you can lose power in some isolated spots. Some limbs and branches come down and minor damage, say to shingles and maybe trash cans rolling down the street. So here's what we're thinking. We're not expecting any watches overnight, but a random warning or two, thunderstorm, flood or tornado warning all in play here. A lot of loud rain, wind and thunder, perhaps to keep you up. And we mentioned before a charged cell phone uh, doubling as an alarm clock. A good idea overnight. Also the tidal flooding because of a strong south wind on the sound. High tide run about a foot above normal and the high tide cycle just about an hour away in Fairfield and New Haven County. So let's go to the satellite and radar, show you where it is. It's now entering central New Jersey, out by Philadelphia and Trenton. Here's the leading edge of it. A more potent line of storms back across central Pennsylvania and down through Virginia. This is tornadic in Kentucky and West Virginia. That never gets here, but it's all connected. It's all relative. Hour by hour we go. Here we are, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Look at these gusty thunderstorms across the state. They're moving from west to east. Here we are at 5 o'clock. They continue pushing away. 7 o'clock, bus stop. 
they are gone. The sun pops out in the afternoon and it turns windy tomorrow, gusting up to about 30 to 35 miles per hour will be those winds. Mid 60s right now. These are fairly close to normal highs for this time of year, not 1020 temperatures. And again, we outline the storm impacts. 60 to 57, your overnight temperatures, keeping an eye on those gusty thunderstorms overnight tonight. By tomorrow morning, they are gone. The afternoon, it's bright, warm and windy. Maybe a run at 80 degrees inland. And the warmer it is, it will be the faster the wind blows. Here's your eight-day forecast, turning much cooler for Thursday and Friday, and temperatures in the 60s by day. 30s and 40s for your overnight temperatures. Chance of rain late Friday into Saturday. Next week is looking pretty unsettled, but all eyes really on overnight tonight. By the time you wake up tomorrow morning, it is gone. So it might be a loud night tonight. Just keep that in mind if you're a sensitive sleeper. All right, we are warned. You Thank ready? you very much. Justin, thanks. And just ahead here tonight on News 8 at 10, we're going to check out the latest viral video that shows a neighborhood boxing match like you probably haven't seen before. One Australian man got a ringside seat to a fight, but it isn't what you'd expect to see, especially since this was in the middle of his street. And Jeannie Mose has more. There's a rumble in the street. Man, nah, not two guys like that. Two guys like this. No wonder the man who shot this put it to music from the Nutcracker. That seemed to be where a lot of the kicks landed. Two male kangaroos, boomers they're called, fighting for dominance or fun in a suburban setting north of Sydney, Australia. It's not so much like boxing, but rather ultimate fighting, 
Nacho Wild described it this way in its world's deadliest series. A favorite tactic, using the forepaws to grip the opponent and then quickly kicking with their huge clawed hind feet. But if you want to see their coolest move, watch this. As he raises his legs to kick, freeze it. He stands on his tail, momentarily supporting his whole body on that bony, muscular tail. They fight like a silent pair of dinosaurs from Jurassic Park. <laughs> Quiet but deadly, a trained boxing kangaroo named Killer Willard took on his handlers during a demonstration at a Cleveland TV station. Wait a minute. This is my husband being <laughs> Now who's the last guy you'd ever imagine boxing a kangaroo? You're gonna watch me fight the Australian light heavyweight champion. It's a young Woody Allen who seemed to mesmerize his opponent in this 60s variety show. <laughs> Woody threw a few pretend punches, the boomer lunged, had Woody in his clutches, but no harm done. Same goes for the brawl in Australia, it seemed pretty much a draw, with one knockdown, but no knockouts. But who needs a leg to stand on when you've got a tail? Genimos, CNN, New York. That would be a first for me. I've never seen that before. Me either. We go out and see deer in the yard. Can you imagine seeing that in the front yard? No. Me either. No. All right. Just ahead here tonight on News 8 at 10. President Obama spent the night in Connecticut tonight, but you had to pay big bucks to see him. We'll explain here in just a minute. And there are a lot of gadgets out there that are supposed to help with distracted driving. Do they work? We'll check it out. Here's meteorologist Justin Goldstein. And keeping an eye on some gusty downpours now entering into New Jersey. That puts it about an hour and a half away from southwestern Connecticut. What to expect overnight in the next eight days, all ahead. And coming up tonight on News 8 at 11, some neighbors in Brantford, North Brantford, fighting a plan to put a big propane storage facility in their neighborhood. We'll show you that fight tonight on News 8 at 11.
We are awaiting a press conference in Hartford about a dangerous house fire that sent at least three firefighters to the hospital. We're hearing one of those firefighters is in very critical condition. The outlook is grim. We'll have all the information for you tonight at 11. President Obama spent the day in Greenwich today. He was at a fundraiser at the Greenwich Polo Club that benefits the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee. Tickets for the event as high as $32,000 a person. Governor Dana Malloy did not attend. The president's last trip to our state was in March. He was in New Britain making a push to raise minimum wage. Former State Representative Christina Ayala briefly faced a judge today. Her court case was continued. She was arrested on the 26th on voting fraud charges. She'll be back in front of a judge on November the 6th. Uh, we have all heard the reports about how much safer hands-free technology is when you're behind the wheel. But a new AAA report says that not that may not be the case. Keith Coons has more on the new technology and new problems created. Play CD. Just because you can do something hands-free behind the wheel doesn't mean you should be doing that behind the wheel. That's the bottom line of a new report on hands-free devices from the AAA Foundation and the University of Utah. The study says voice-based systems are even more distracting to drivers than other devices. In fact, it further confirms that hands-free is not risk-free. The study looked at different hands-free options and graded them on a one-to-five scale in terms of distraction. Things like changing the radio station or climate control were at the bottom, both scoring a one. But more complicated tasks required much more of a driver's concentration. For example, if you're using an in-car device to compose an email, that's a level three distraction. If you're using an in-car device to listen to an email or a text message, that's a level two distraction. AAA researchers also looked at six in-car voice-activated systems. They found Toyota's the least distracting, with the Chevy system and Apple's Siri system to be more distracting for drivers. The message to consumers is you should really limit the use of these in-vehicle systems until manufacturers can improve them, make them less error-prone and easier to use. Keith Koontz, News 8. And just ahead, meteorologist Justin Goldstein has a look at your forecast. All right, we showed this at the top of the show. Here's a live view from Stratford. There's the water line. It was about here 25 minutes ago. Some minor flooding going on along the shoreline. We'll talk about that. Your eight-day forecast, check the radar. We'll see you on the other side of the break. And some baseball fans get to party with their heroes. We'll show you the big surprise at the bar coming up.
We're watching this thing come in. Justin, what are we, hour and a half or so from hitting the corner of the state? Kind of? Yeah, out by Greenwich, Fairfield County, the gateway to New England, and it's going to work from west to east. How high are the winds going to be? Uh, some gusts could get to 50 to 55 inside some thunderstorms. Not everyone sees okay. that. Here's a look at the storm impacts, and you see wind the highest concern here. When you get to the 50 to 55 threshold, again, briefly obtaining that, that's where you can get some limbs to come down, some branches, they'll fall on power lines, and you talk about sporadic power outages. Have to mention that brief risk of an isolated tornado because it's so windy and the winds are changeable as you go up in the atmosphere. Any thunderstorm could hit that pocket of wind and start spinning. Remember back to July, we'll get the tornado on the ground for about 30 seconds. We recall the damage it did there. So after the gusty storms overnight, tomorrow is just a windy day. Not expecting damage tomorrow. Still gusty on Thursday. Thursday trends much cooler. Here's an outline of those gusty winds tonight in the 50 to 55 range. A lot of damage to the uh, leaves, some disruption of utilities because of those limbs, and some minor damage to structures such as shingles coming down. Perhaps a wooden fence might have uh, one or two posts missing from it. At 35, we do not expect that kind of damage tomorrow. Here's what the weather department's thinking. No watches overnight, but a warning or two. Flood warning, severe thunderstorm warning, even a tornado warning not out of the realm of possibilities. We've got your back right here. We're staying here all night until the threat passes. A lot of loud wind, rain, and some thunder will keep you up at night. And a backup alarm for a cell phone right next to the bed, a good idea. In case the power flickers and your clock goes to 12 o'clock, you'll want to get up tomorrow morning on time and don't be late. Here's a live look from Stratford. That water creeping up high tide is about 40 minutes away. And because of all the wind and the full moon, south wind pushing up against the southwestern Connecticut shoreline, high tides ranging about a foot above normal. And about 11 to 11.15 is when we expect those tides from New Haven over to Coscov and Greenwich. Rain is now in New Jersey and some gusty wind with this, but there are no warnings. Let's pull the perspective out. Some more gusty storms across Pennsylvania, Maryland and Virginia. This is nasty and tornadic across Kentucky and West Virginia. That never makes it here, but the whole complex is moving in our direction. It's clear to see in the hour by hour forecast. 3 a.m. Very unusual timing for this time of day and this time of year. Watch them come, the storms, across from New York into Connecticut. The areas of yellow and orange are your downpours. This is where the winds to briefly 50 to 55 will be contained in these downpours. By first thing tomorrow morning as the kids head off to the bus stop, 7 a.m., look at this, the state is clear. Fast moving storms, they are gone. Sun pops out, blending with clouds in the afternoon. It is a gusty day, 30 to 35 mile per hour winds, but it's warm. It doesn't stay warm for long. Temperatures now very mild, 61 Stafford, 64 Middletown, Bradford at 64, so is Bethel, Bethel at 63, Adam at 61, and Groton in New London at 63 as well. Cloudy and breezy until the rain arrives, and then temperatures drop between 57 and 60 degrees. Some of those storms could be gusty. Tomorrow morning, storms. What storms? Bright sunshine, some wispy clouds. The wind blows tomorrow close to 80 inland. It's deceptive. Your car will read 78. It will feel like 68 or 70 with the wind chill. Here's your eight-day forecast. Temperatures drop off big time Thursday, upper 50s to low 60s. Chance of rain Friday late into early Saturday, not looking like an all-day rain out. Next week looks a little unsettled, but you see the trend here for much cooler and gustier weather. We're going to keep an eye on tonight. We'll see you over at Channel 8 at 11 o'clock with an update. Sounds like a beach day tomorrow. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah. If you got the day off. I don't know. Right. Just, thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much. All right, Noah, what's coming up in sports? Well, we're going to be talking about baseball. We have the National League Division Series teams trying to make it to the uh, championship series. So Eric will join me with that. And we're going to talk a little football, too. It seems like we've got a little problem going on that caused the cancellation of a full season. Uh, we'll have that story. Heard about that. All yeah. right. Thanks very much. Okay. All right, well, thanks. That'll do it tonight for News 8 at 10. That was next. Good night.